at Pat Tokac, joined Continental's AI Development Center team at Budapest in 2021, building and leading a group of engineers, focusing on comprehensive environment modeling and various autonomous driving applications, holding a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Budapest University in Technology and Economics. He received his PhD in surgical robotics from Obuda University. Adpat has more than seven years of engineering and business development experience in the autonomous driving industry in both startup and corporate environments. The title of his talk, The Anatomy of Autonomous Driving Projects. Please welcome with a huge round of applause, Adpat Tokac. Thank you. You raise your hand if you can hear me. All right. That makes 20 of us. Great to see you here, and uh, thank you for joining. Um, let me start with a quick question. Do you guys remember the first time when you sat in a vehicle and you started accelerating, holding the steering wheel? How did it feel? It was interesting, right? I'm in control. It's scary as well. I remember mine. I was uh, right beside a cornfield on an abandoned road, and I was sitting in the driver's seat, holding the steering wheel, understanding that I am right now in control of more than one tons, and it's going where I want it to go. So I'm responsible what's happening there. A couple of years later, I've got a chance to sit in a car which had an adaptive cruise control function integrated, and also a lane keeping assistant, which means that I had the power to give the control to the vehicle and make sure that while I'm still in control of the situation, more or less, enjoy how the wheel is smoothly turning and keeping the distance, the vehicle is keeping the distance from the vehicle before me. Now, that's also a bit scary because I'm not the one then who's actually thinking for the acceleration or the stealing. There's someone else, but I'm still there in control, more or less, right? Then a few years back, I was sitting in a prototype vehicle, a prototype vehicle that was accelerating and was heading 110 kilometers per hour on one of the highways in Hungary. And it had a software running, a software which had a couple of my lines of code that I wrote. That's scary as well. You're in control. At least you have a part of your work that's in control of what's happening in the vehicle. How you make sure that it's still safe? Obviously, we have safety drivers. Obviously, we have a lot of testers who are among us making sure that it's a safe prototype. But what's the road from that safe prototype to the point when we can enroll these technologies to the actual customer, customer market? Now, this is something I would like to talk about today, especially on how we involve artificial intelligence in this development process. So bear with me for today. Let me see if I can can step. For some reason, the pointer does not work. Now it does. All right, great. So vision zero. Uh, for the past couple of years, the community of automated driving was revolving about one question, how we can make self-driving safer. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands fatalities out in the roads, which could be prevented because most of these accidents are caused by human error. Now, the big question is, what is it that we can bring as a technology, as a software technology to reduce this number? And for this, the Vision Zero concept was created. Now, this is a general concept. It doesn't mean that we don't see anything, all right? So it's not about our vision. It's the vision that we have so, to, so that we have zero fatalities out there. And the road for that means that we need to increase the complexity. We need to un understand how we increase the functionality of self-driving or driver assistance systems. And that brings one single question. Are the current technology that we use, or are the old technologies that we use, are sufficient to bring the desired level of self-driving to the roads? And um, in order to do that, Continental has been working in this autonomous mobility division quite a long time now with a couple of thousand engineers to bring these products out to the road. So let me just give you a brief 
introduction of who we are, who I am in general, and how we connect to all the Vision Zero concept. Uh, I myself have been in the autonomous driving industry for almost eight years, working in business development, working in software development as well. Currently, I'm leading a group of engineers, vehicle integration engineers and software engineers, algorithm engineers, at Continental's autonomous mobility division with the product line parking. So what we do is the development of automated parking solutions. And uh, we are located in the heart of Budapest, in inner city, with an office of about 250 engineers working towards algorithm development, product-based AI development. We also have a large number of software engineers working on the infrastructure of data collection, data pipeline, high computing clusters, and we also have a great knowledge about the architecture, how all these building blocks of autonomous driving are built up. We are also uh, consisting of an application development center, bringing the actual prototypes to products with our customers. So in general, we have a wide understanding of how the whole chain of development of automated driving works. Now, this is a concept that we've been seeing quite a lot in the past years saving lives with AI. What does it mean? How do I save lives with AI? And let me bring the mandatory ChatGPT answer for that for my presentation. So you can ask ChatGPT, right? How would I see a life? Um, this is a very accurate and very useless answer for a software engineer. So we need to somehow approach this question from a different point of view. In general, we would like to have our solution robust. We want to have our solution something that sees beyond the human capabilities. And that means that we generally need to gradually introduce the intelligence to the system. And it's been around for quite a long time. This is probably a table that most of you have seen in different forms about the levels of self-driving. Self-driving hasn't been invented in the past two years, and not in the past 10, to be honest. But in the past six years, we've been revolving about to define the levels of self-driving that we need for regulators, to developers, to understand which level to shoot in order to bring this technology into production. Now, level zero, level one, and level two is something that we call advanced driver assistance systems, which means that the driver is still responsible for whatever happens, the technology is only helping us to execute the tasks. This also means that, for example, in level zero, we only have some warming signals. Level one, we have either the steering or the acceleration control. And at level two, we have a combination of steering and acceleration control by the system with the supervision of the human driver. And this is where we are most of the time when we are hearing about driver assistance systems out in the market, we are talking about level two, level two plus systems. Some systems already flowing into level three. Um, but now we are in a really interesting point in time in automated driving development. Because now we see that we actually have the technology and the capability to move from the driver assistance to partial and then later highly automated systems. So what do these systems mean? It means that these systems are capable of supervising the whole driving chain without the presence of the driver for some time. At level three, the driver is allowed to take his or her um, atten uh, attention from the driving to something else like texting or eating a hamburger on the driver's seat. On level four, this time is longer, which allows us to sleep in the vehicle and the vehicle will move to a safe state if it's not capable of solving the driving problem. At level five, we don't need a steering wheel or a pedal in the vehicle. And the big difference between the two is where the actual responsibility and the projection of what's going to happen in the system is. Because at level zero, one and two, we as humans are anticipating what's going to happen there. We have a full understanding of the environment and we are to act immediately if a warning sign is given. While in level three, level four, we have to have a more comprehensive knowledge of the environment around us to predict what's going to happen, or at least have different ideas what need to be solved later on. 
Coming back to parking, and this is arguably one of the most interesting and still uh, simplest way of introducing the chain of automated driving. We have a very simple, simple task. Find a parking spot and park your car in there, right? This is something that we see in most of the vehicles of today. There is an offered parking spot. We press the green button, and the car will park in the spot, or at least will try to. And what you see here is a photo that I took from our office, and it's just the perfect place for it. A homogeneous asphalt, very well seen solid lines, curbstone which will, which will stop you if you're going too far, which can be detected with an ultrasonic sensor. It's a sunny day, nobody's around. Now, this is something that we can solve today. And this is something that's, that can be solved with traditional algorithms as well. The problem is that the uh, environment is more complex than them. And in order to move forward, we need to step out of this very beautiful comfort zone and get about 150 meters away from our office. And then the word opens up. And it's a beautiful, colorful word, because you have curbs that you need to take care about. And they are not that nice that were in the previous image. You have barriers you need to take care about there on the right hand side. You have the poles, which are not really our best friends if you're talking about sensors with really low uh, resolution. The walls that we need to care, care about because we really cannot really go over these walls unless we are planning for a monster truck, which is also possible, by the way. Markings, lane markings, let there be lines on the, on the curbs, curbs li lines on the, on the pavement, parking lines or any other line. The dirt on the road is not homogeneous anymore. The shadows, which are changing, the lighting conditions are changing during the day. So you have to handle that as well somehow. You have the tiles or tiled pavement, the cobblestones, vegetation, which also changes throughout the year. You have other artifacts. Artifacts on the road that you need to take care about, and you have to understand whether you can go over it or under it. And then, obviously, the word as it is as a complex. We have the vehicles as well, and vulnerable road users. And to be honest, this is where, uh, where, the, where the safety comes in, because one of the most, I would say, easiest ways to, to, to understand the safety is how not to hit a pedestrian or a vehicle while you're parking. Right, it's a low-speed scenario, um, easier to go by than high-speed scenarios out there. And this is what we would like to achieve. And at this point, it comes evident that you need to use complex algorithms, complex approaches to understand these types of complex words uh, at the end of the day. Self-driving is all about the sensing of the environment, planning, and acting on our plans. How do we sense this environment and how we recreate the 3D world around us is crucial. Because you cannot account for every single leaf on the trees. You cannot account every single dirt spot on the asphalt. You need to see what's relevant, but you need to see all of that. And for that, right now, we are using artificial intelligence and a lot of sensors around the vehicle to make this happen. And this is the chain of self-driving. At the end of the day, it all comes down to three blocks. And we are talking about software development, and we are talking about an architecture of software. This is very easy, right? Put three teams. One team is doing the sensation. The other one, the planning. Third one is an act. Maybe you need an integration team, which will make it happen in the vehicle. And then what happens is you understand what's happening in the environment. You plan your trajectory. You control your acceleration. The vehicle moves, the environment changes. Because we are in a different spot, vehicles are moving around us, which means that we need to replan, we need to recreate this 3D environment, and we do it about 25 to 30 times a second. Which also means that you need to optimize for the actual hardware you're running on, because you can't really run it on huge server parks unless you are pulling a nuclear reactor with the vehicle with you in the trailer. So, there's a lot of optimization, uh, optimization out there as well. But at the end of the day, this is what it all looks like. So let's build a self-driving car. And I will talk about sensing, first of all. Sensing is all about 
understanding what you can do with your sensors. And as humans, we use our eyes, we use our ears sometimes as well. We use our understanding of the inertia that we have in the vehicle. And now we have to redeem it with digital sensors. We're using cameras, radars, lidars, ultrasonic sensors, name it. We put a lot of them in the vehicle, and we believe that it's going to have 360-degree uh, coverage of the environment that we can use to recreate. But there's actually one point here that's different from the human understanding. What we get from these sensors is raw data, unstructured, raw, noisy data. And the world is going toward a direction where we are using these unstructured data on a central computational unit where we comprehend this information. So we might be talking about smart sensors, which is also out there in the market, make no mistake. But rather we are working on unstructured data collected in one place, one computational unit inside the vehicle with smart algorithms, and then fusing this data, this is what we call sensor fusion, by the way, to have a three-dimensional environment reconstruction. And if we are talking about a more complex situation than the actual line detection on the parking spot that I showed you earlier, we have to go back a bit to a couple of years back when we started, when the whole autonomous driving industry started comprehending the information from cameras. Back in the days, line detection worked as following. You see a line, and then you say, all right, any white solid line that I see in the camera might be a line. So let's select those. And then after that, I'm just going to do some filtering, maybe tracking, and I'll find the lines on the camera image. Unfortunately, the reflection from the barrier of the road or guardrails is also a white line, solid line. So it's not working that, like that anymore. Same thing works with humans. Human detection was all about analyzing the image. And obviously, you cannot compare every single pixel of a human image to a database of humans. You can do that, but it's not going to scale, not, scale, uh, not going to scale up to the level where you want to do self-driving. So what we did 10, 15 years ago was to simplify the image, use transformations, edges, extract edges, reduce the, the, the pixel number, even do some uh, histogram-oriented transformations and compare these transformated images to each other. And it worked quite well for not safety-critical systems. And then, in the new times, convolutional neural networks appeared. And convolutional neural networks did something that we did differently. In these cases, we did not tell the system what a, what a human looks like. We did not tell the system what the analysis of these images. We told the system to look at the images and extract what makes a human a human on an image, which meant that this kind of intelligence allowed us for a larger, scalable, and I would rather say error-free system in terms of detections on, on, on very well-trained data. But the word has moved on in the past 10 years since the first convolution networks uh, were introduced. And there are many, many solutions that we use today, AI-based or AI-aided, in our automated driving products that comprehend the environment. We can use little boxes around the vehicles that we sense. We can do semantic segmentation, which will give us an exact class estimation for every single pixel out there in the image. We can go ahead and we say, OK, let's, so, let's use ultrasonic systems, ultrasonic sensor data processing, LIDARs, LIDAR data processing. We can move forward. We do three-dimensional estimation, depth estimation with neural networks, which means that we have a lot of different algorithms at our hand to integrate into the sense part of the system. And if you look at different uh, benchmarks for data processing, especially for image processing or radar or camera and LiDAR uh, processing, you will see that the leading board for these images to understand uh, what's happening in Grazis is always consisting of AI-based systems. 
Well, if we see more images, if we see uh, more objects on the road around us, and we have a larger precision, that means that we have a better safety of the system as well. But still, automated driving has used two different ways to comprehend it in products. And this can be divided into two large groups. One of them is a the low-speed maneuvering, which means parking or driving in cities with well-known HD maps, taxi services. On the other hand, we have the high-speed maneuvering, which you might actually know as driver assistance systems on the highways, pilot aid systems, autopilot systems, cruising aid systems. Two seemingly different words, but at the end of the day, they use the very same set of algorithms and the very same set of approaches from these sensors, which we believe at some point are going to meet. And this is a key point here. If you take low-speed maneuvering, we use surround views with cameras. We use radar belts around the vehicle to understand what's happening. We are detecting markings and curbs for parking. We use collision avoidance when there's a child stepping behind us, we brake. We have parking systems which are parking on a memory basis. On the other hand, in high-speed maneuvering, we use the front vision cameras. <coughs> we, has, we have long-range radar applications for adaptive cruise controls. We have lane detection. We have these emergency braking assists, which you might actually encounter a lot of times uh, during driving modern vehicles. And we might actually also use HD maps. And there's a correlation between them, which means that if you want to have a level four, level five level uh, self-driving, you might actually just need to merge these two approaches. But it's yet to come, which means in the meantime, we have to gradually add new and new functionalities and features to the systems. But it works today. So this is an image of, uh, of an AI-based parking house uh, scenario where we are detecting objects, wheel stoppers, pedestrians. We are de detecting the parking slots as well. So it works independently. These components are out there. But the question is, if these AI uh, components are out there, are they ready to be integrated? into the systems we have today, systems which are automotive rate systems, systems that need to be safe enough so that when we are rolling out these uh, products to the market, people will trust them. And they will actually do the safe driving that we require from them. Sensor fusion is another thing that developed in the meantime. We understood that a single sensor and a single source of information is not enough to assure this redundancy. You cannot trust a single camera. You cannot trust a single uh, input from, from a reader if you want a complex scenario to be uh, comprehended. So we started fusing sensor data, not necessarily in chronological order, but first we started fusing different sensor data for the very same object using cameras and riders or cameras and radars to look at the same vehicle because cameras have a good understanding of what I'm seeing, but it cannot give you an exact distance. Radar is going to do that for you. Same thing happens when you are using, for example, ultrasonic data and LiDAR data, and you understand that it's not only important for you to understand the objects that are moving around you, but it's also important to understand what the static environment consists of, right? right? The, the walls, the barriers, the poles, for which in the past couple of years, occupancy grids have started to appear. So what you see here in the bottom left corner is a top view of the environment of the vehicle. And then we already have an understanding of where the barriers, where the objects are, whether moving or static. And in the past couple of years, neural networks also appeared in sensor fusion which means that the sensor data I was talking to you about, how raw image data or raw radar data is coming to the central computer, now is comprehended by AI. We train a neural network, and this neural network will be the one who's uh, comprehending this data and gives a one-shot estimation of the actual list of objects and list of environmental artifacts that I need to look into. But as always, it's always a question, how do I find the right balance here? 
when I'm using artificial intelligence-based algorithms, the safety question, how deterministic it is, how well I can trust the system for the 100th to 200th time, is it always going to give me the very same input that I, as I, as I uh, received two days ago to a very similar scenario? Now, this is still under research. Explainable AI, right? On the other hand, we have the classical solutions which work. Take your ABS system in your vehicle. There's no way that these systems are not going to be trusted even though you're driving 130 kilometers per hour on a highway. You trust the system that it's going to save your life if there's a slippery road, and still it's not going to malfunction during the high speeds. And we trust those systems, so how do we bring in the artificial intelligence into the system? How do we keep the balance not tipping over to, to a system that we don't completely understand yet, or we are not capable of testing through it. And the answer for that is some kind of a synergy that I would like to show you now. This is a sensor fusion project we've been working on. What you see here is a traditional occupancy map that we create using ultrasonic sensor data and classical camera algorithms. But what's different here is that we're using artificial intelligence semantic segmentation images to map the detection type, the classes, to the actual occupancy, which means that we have a synergy between the classical occupancy detection and the AI-based input from our neural networks. That means that we can find the parking spot, we can find these static obstacles around us, and this is going to be easier for us to comprehend the environment Make sure that we are planning a trajectory. That's the blue line that you see there. And also do the activation of the vehicle into the parking spot. It's also very important to mention that we are capable of filtering out, for example, the moving objects as well, which allows us to separately test and deliver functionalities like parking or collision avoidance, which is very well received by the automotive industry because the more you can test components separately, the safer your system is going to be. And that's for the sensing part. And due to, the, uh, due to the shortness of time, I wouldn't go into the plan and act as one. But these components, these algorithms that I mentioned earlier for sensing, they do exist for the actual trajectory planning out in the world, whether in research phase or production phase, and also for the actuation. So we are aiding our systems with artificial intelligence. We are not taking it over completely. So we are building a synergy. Question arises, how you do it in the current uh, software development world where we are having component teams delivering software components, algorithms, and delivering teams for embedded platforms and the vehicle itself. Unfortunately or fortunately, the reality is way more complex than I showed you earlier. So if you ever worked in software development and have seen architectures, it's more like this, or even worse. We have components that are relying on each other, but still there is a loop inside the system. Plus, we have external dependencies, and we somehow have to manage the requirements. We have to manage the, the continuous delivery. We have to manage the tools as well for these teams to be able to deliver this complex system. So what do these blocks consist of? One of the blocks may be a camera processing block. The other one can be a radar processing block. Third one could be a sensor fusion block. Another one is a CI-CD pipeline block. We can go ahead, let's say we have a hardware integration, software integration block. At the end of the day, you realize that the actual algorithm development is just a part of the whole system delivery and the reason for that is that you are delivering, delivering to an actual mechanical component, a vehicle that moves. And from that on, it's not a web page development or it's not a, not a, a banking system development, which has a different rule set. And not aviation at either, which has very other type of redundancy system to be uh, managed. This is an automotive system. And with an automotive system, you have to take the top-down approach and say, okay, at this point, I need to understand what the actual automotive processes I need to adhere, adhere to. And this means testing. This means uh, the requirement engineering. 
test specifications, it means code quality, and so on. And when you're talking about AI development, which is quite an innovative development of today, and when you're talking about algorithm development of classical uh, algorithms as well, this is also something that you do as reading articles and implementing. So how do you manage these colleagues to be aware of the actual automotive processes that they need to, need to uh, follow? Well, there are a couple of tricks to do that. And uh, I'm personally, I'm very, very passionate about how you build up these projects and how you manage the organization so that it can be done. First of all, the scalability is a big question. Because cell driving you can do with five people in a garage. And you can also do cell driving with a thousand people. The question is, <laughs> what is it that scales with more people? The complexity of the architecture, the project, I would say delivery, and project planning, and it also scales the actual processes that you are following. Because with five people, you just sit down in a room, right, and then you discuss with each other, and you do something that works, hacked into the system, but it works. But in the meantime, you have to make sure that you are questioning the safety, the compliance of the processes of your system while you're scaling up your project. At the end of the day, you have to integrate everything into the system, into a working system. And we all know when you're first integrating, it's never working for the first time. Not for a second either. Um, you have to make sure that while you are developing the features, these algorithms, you're also testing against the actual system, which is the vehicle that's running out in the roads. And in the meantime, you also have to do software in the loop, hardware in the loop tests as well. Now, a couple of things that we've seen and, uh, and might have a burden into this kind of development. Keeping the order. Have you ever seen a project development that started with the actual system integration without the actual requirement written for the algorithms. No, right? Never. No, no, no. So it never happens that we are testing something in real life before it got into, into software in the loop testing, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's something that we cannot avoid, especially in prototyping phase. But the big question is, are you able to deliver a complex software to the vehicle without having all the sensors, all the algorithms integrated into the system? And how do you uh, prioritize between these tasks when you're leading a, an organization of 200 people? And the answer is quite simple. You have to involve the integration people into the planning phase of when it can be done and how it can be done. And the other part is, is more tricky. You have to educate the people, the algorithm developers and the researchers as well, what's going to wait for that piece of program that is going to be deployed to the vehicle. And for that, you have to have the flow of information, especially in international teams, we tend to forget to share information that might be relevant to other teams. And if we are working in silos, and this is the old way of developing software, developing comp components in little cages, then this order is never going to be kept because we will all have or our own deadlines, but without the system overview, we won't be able to deliver in time, no matter what. And this system overview is crucial. So if you want to scale this agile in an automated driving development, and it's no rocket science, the one thing that you need to do is based on what needs to be done, discuss with the teams, and obviously have a plan for the whole. But then make sure that before the actual PI planning, for example, get the information back from the teams, what can be and cannot be done on the system level, on the actual integration level. On the other hand, in an ideal life, agile really strains are flowing in a very nice, ideal way. All teams making sure that they are delivering in time, they're delivering with the same velocity. In reality, that doesn't work. In reality, the discomponents of the agile really strain might be faster or, or, or slower than the other ones. They may be having more workload or less workload. There might be some teams who are completely broken off the train, have no idea what they're doing. And the only way 
to avoid that is creating cross-functional teams. And cross-functional doesn't mean that every single team member has to know everything about the components. Rather, it means that we have to facilitate the understanding of the delivery of the other teams as well. And it's easier said than done, right? So in reality, an AI research engineer wouldn't be able to understand all the part what an integration team is doing in the vehicle and vice versa, and why they're doing it and what their difficulties are. And product owners thinks and Scrum of Scrums won't solve this issue. What can solve this issue is the actual communication between the engineers and having understanding each other's burdens, each other's difficulties, and sitting together in the vehicle, by the way, debugging the system together to understand why it is important that I'm delivering and how it can be helped by other teams. And this is a change of an era. And um, when we walked into Agile from the classical way of software development, we also opened the doors to this kind of cross-functional teams. And now it's evident that it needs to be done. Because if I want to deliver an AI-based component to a system that's an embedded system, and it's going to be built into the vehicle, it's going to be tested against a test truck, it's going to be tested on a public road, that also means I have to have an understanding on the whole software engineering process. I have to have an understanding of the actual algorithms, say deep learning, I'm using. I have to understand the automotive processes, what my component is going to be tested against, what the requirements are going to be, how do I write a test specification for it. I need to know about embedded optimization. I need to know that my software is going to run on the vehicle and on a target part platform. And I need to know about architecture because I need to know where I fit into the system. And believe me or not, this has to be done on an engineering level. So if you're working with software engineers, this is something that, uh, that's going to be a challenge for everyone in the future. But it can be done. And I, personally, I do believe it's, it can be done because that's the only way that we are delivering quality software, that we are extending our view beyond the silos, beyond, beyond those cages that we kind of closed ourselves and locked ourselves in before the actual agile development in, in, uh, in automated driving. So what's next? And uh, what's going to be the next perturbation in the system using more AI? And uh, there are a couple of hypes around us already. And I will start with the generative models down in the bottom. And yeah, we are talking about generative models. We, there can be also language models, but I'm talking about generative models that we use for automated driving, generating scenes, generating data for training, generating data for testing, realistic data that will help us exploit more the actual possibilities that we have in artificial intelligence for both the sensing part and the actuation and planning. And it's a quite interesting part because currently what we do is data collection manually and labeling manually. And all those scenarios that might have some kind of edge cases, let's say there's a meteorite flying into the, to the highway and it's a half sunny, half snowy weather, that challenge is not necessarily solved with all the data that we collected. But if we generate these kind of uh, situations, we can test against the redundancy, we can test against the actual uh, scalability of, of our AI solutions, increase safety. Bird's eye view networks can't go around it anymore. Bird's eye view net networks are basically networks which are creating a one-shot model of the environment based on all input data processed from radars, cameras. And uh, it helps us already understanding the distance of the objects around us by using only camera images. Although it's an indirect measurement, so we need to be careful that this is also something that we need to test against. But that also means that all the environmental modeling part, all the part that I was talking about in the sensor fusion for, uh, for occupancy grids and the other image, if you saw in the bottom right corner, the radar camera fusion now can be done in one step. Very fancy then. And near radiance fields, recreating images 
from 2D images, recreating words, 3D words from 2D images for testing, for data collection, is another way of exploiting this AI in the actual development process. Coming to the end of the presentation, I would like to share with you a couple of takeaways. So first of all, um, we're talking, still talking about uh, safety. We're ta still talking about the Vision Zero, how to save lives and how to increase the road safety. And one of the obvious roads for that is to have more complex functionalities safely deployed to the self-driving vehicles. And for that, we need better algorithms. We need algorithms that are performing way better than the previous algorithms that we used in any other uh, functionality earlier integrated into the systems. And that's a good thing that we have a purpose. Because I personally, I do, do believe in this purpose, but I do believe that most of us also do it. Because we are experiencing it while we are driving. And um, honestly, I've been in a couple of situations the past couple of years when I know that the driver assistance system saved me from an accident, or at least from some kind of a crash. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But it's also a realization. Balance is a key. Uh, currently, we have good algorithms for AI. But it's also important to see that the classical methods are still something that we are hanging on to, because this is something that we know that already proven to be working. And the third one is very important one, probably most important synergy among these competence fields. So if we have these synergies in cross-functional uh, teams, and we have the knowledge and the competence for different parts of automated driving, this will eventually bring us to faster delivery of our products. So these are the messages I would like you to take home. And on that note, thank you very much for your attention. You can see my uh, contact information here on this slide. And I uh, usually say, drive safe until there's a system who's driving better than you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We won't have time for all the questions, unfortunately, but we're jumping into it. What do you think? What will be the next robust industry, like automotive, where the industry will try to eliminate the human factor? That's a personal uh, view. Mining. Mining and agriculture. Definitely. In short. All right, okay. <laughs> We're going to have more, more <laughs> time for more questions then. Perfect. If you keep it up, we'll answer all of them. Okay, number I two. I can elaborate that, actually. <laughs> but you can approach me after the, um, after the session. I'd be happy to That's to perfect. We can do a lightning round style, and yeah. then whoever wants to know more just can look you up or go, go to you after. All right. Do you think self-driving can work together with other human drivers on the road? Can these systems be prepared for every type of human behavior? Now that requires a longer answer. Uh, yes, I do believe, and I do think that it, it can be done. Um, the big question is how we implement the human-like behavior into the self-driving, and do we want to? Uh, the big question here is whether, uh, whether it helps the human drivers or whether it helps the human occupants into the vehicle to imitate the driving style of humans in these, in these vehicles. And um, there are so many unseen or unwritten rules in driving that we are so hanging on to that it's kind of going to be unavoided to have this kind of implementation for a better coexistence of humans and, and self-driving vehicles at the level five level.